Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India uh, Philosophies tries to you know strongly espouse now although uh, women appropriate nature their appropriation in a way does not constitute a relationship of dominance or a property relations which means it, it doesn't you know cater to a harmful uh, you know impact on uh, uh, the environment like what others do like for instance the corporates or if not the uh, industrialists normally engage into now women are uh, sort of not the you know sold uh, owners or proprietors of uh, their own bodies uh, and and similarly of the art but rather they tend to you know cooperate with their bodies and with the art in order to let grow and to make grow now this sort of produce and reproduce is to be you know seen in the uh, context of how women perceive themselves that is their body and then at the same time the earth that is the provider now now similarly if one have that kind of deep rooted ecological awareness or sort of uh, a realization one might not possibly you know uh, engage in harming if not uh, the idea of domination or dominance might perhaps not prevailed. Now as producers of new life they also became the first subsistence producers and also the invention of the first productive economy by implying from the beginning of social production and the creation of social relations that is of society and history now how does this then this gender ideology uh, versus the recovery of this feminine principle to be you know uh, contextualized we uh, have seen the kind of the categories of this masculine and feminist as something which is you know uh, being uh, learned as a result of socialization that is socially and culturally constructed that is which begins in the family now this gender based ideology in a way projects these uh, categories as biologically determined or which in a way uh, as i often says can be uh, contextualized from the essence essentializing this idea of the biological uh, uh, aspects of differences between men and women now the western concept of this masculinity that has dominated development and uh, gender relations has excluded all that has been defined by culture as feminine and has legitimized control over old counts as such now uh, another uh, uh, feminist who uh, has extensively written uh, on the women that is Simone de Beauvoir uh, uh, talks about how this feminine and masculine are you know biologically established and perhaps as a result of this women's liberation is prescribed as a masculinization of the female that is women's uh, liberation is uh, to be uh, you know located or contextualized in the biology that is in the physical body from bondage to life's mysterious processes so therefore in a way uh, to liberate is to you know uh, masculinize the female it consists of uh, women battling against the elements of becoming masculine now uh, you you can perhaps also refer the works of judith butler where 
she talk about the gender troubles. Now there are a lot sort source of you know a uh, uh, feminist philosopher which which tries to depict and talk about how this uh, gender, which is socially and culturally constructed, has also, to some extent, uh, led to the kind of uh, relationship be relation between uh, uh, men and nature, or the uh, sort of idea of this feminine principle. Now, as Mice points out, the patriarchal myth of this man which usually engage in hunting implies the following levels of violence in man's relationship with nature. Now, usually as I was talking uh, uh, in the third world countries, uh, women usually engage in you know collecting uh, the forest products like, like the food, the fruits, the roots and so on and so forth, which in a way is not you know hampering too much the uh, to the biodiversity in a sense, but the kind of profession which man usually is perceived or expected to engage as mice pointed out here uh, in a way uh, has uh, conditioned the relationship of man with nature. The hunter's man's main tools in a way are not instruments with which to produce life, but to destroy it. It, it is not, uh, it, it does not, you know, uh, uh, reflect the idea of reproducing, but rather to destroy or destruction. This gives hunters, you know, an overriding power over living beings, both animals and humans, which does not arise out of their own productive work. And secondly, this objective relationship, which is mediated through the use of arms, that is violence, therefore is basically a predatory or exploitative one. Now, therefore, the kind of profession, if not how man engages by using uh, not just uh, the tools, in a way has sort of uh, Receive and conditioned their relationship with nature. Now, the objective of relationship to nature mediated by using these uh, uh, arms in a way constitute a relationship of dominance and uh, not of cooperation between human and nature. And therefore, this appropriation of uh, natural substances, uh, which is in a way uh, talked about Marx now also become a process of one-sided appropriation that is of establishing property relations not in the sense of humanization, but all but uh, in the context of exploitation of nature. So, this idea of property if not the idea of sense of ownership where men in a way have excessive rights to control in a way is being developed through this appropriation of uh, natural substances. Mice concluded by saying that while this patriarchal paradigm has made man the hunter and exemplar of human productivity, he is basically you know to be branded as a parasite and not a producer. Now, this sort of uh, destructive uh, persona which is pretty much embedded in man in a way has eventually led to you know engage in a more destructive uh, nature. Now, women in the forest, forests have been for uh, in the history of Indian civilization has been pretty much uh, related with women and also primarily with the you know the source of life and fertility and the forest also is seen as a community which has been viewed as a model for societal and civilizational evolution. Now, this is how uh, the Indian civilizations address or perceive forests and also uh, they are seen as a source of life and which is venerated as sacred which I have we have discussed at length when we talk about uh, the relationship between religion, ecology, uh, or maybe in the context of 
the different religion perspective like Buddhism and uh, uh, the Hindu religion. The forest does in a way uh, you know nurture an ecological civilization in the most fundamental sense of harmony and nature which of course we don't have to you know go in deep detail again presuming that you are familiar with how uh, religion in a way you know tends to you know uh, conceive nature if not forest. Now a critic of the gender analysis which Shiva and uh, Rasni Kothari provided uh, uh, the draws our attention wherein an explicit and often implied equivalence between women and nature as if women are by definition uh, seen as conservationist life enhancing and equity seeking. So, therefore, this idea of uh, you know perception which is being uh, sort of the language which is being uh, uh, used uh, as a category of gender is you know strongly being criticized by Shiva and Kothari. Now, with respect to Shiva's line of spiritual ecofeminism and also towards the many that see tradition as sort of the savior of uh, sustainable natural resource management, there are many you know counter arguments to be aware of. Therefore, eco feminism also has a tendency to focus on an essentialized idea of women. Now, uh, without much ado, I will just uh, I am sure you are, you are pretty much familiar with the ecological feminist philosophies by now and then sort of a uh, I would like to present a case uh, in the Indian context where the uh, perhaps the first uh, eco-feminist or the environmental conservation movement has started. And uh, I am pretty sure like uh, many of you might be you know aware about the Chipko movement. Chipko in the literal meaning is you know uh, which means hugging a tree or embrace as the village where you know uh, engaging in hugging uh, the trees locally known as the Angwald. The movement this Chifko movement is best known for is its tactic of hugging trees to prevent them being cut down and to prevent commercial timber harvesting. As we had discussed about the Bisnoi community in terms of uh, conservation of uh, biodiversity or forest uh, in a way this uh, the Chipko movement is uh, you know pretty much influenced by the Bisnoi community in Rajasthan. Now, this particular movement began uh, as a result of the government's uh, decision to you know uh, allot uh, the forest trees for the sports good company. You know what uh, the woods are used for, for instance, maybe uh, making a cricket bat, so and so forth. So, uh, and then different uh, items of the sports uh, goods, in a way, demands the use of the forest uh, raw materials. The local residents of this Gopes were, were denied the similar demands of getting new fee trees required for making farm tools. So, that sort of you know uh, in, uh, indifference which are being uh, meted out uh, whereas, the government favoring the uh, sports company and on the other hand uh, deny, denial of uh, you know uh, accessing the forest for making the agriculture tools that sort of dichotomy in a way is being inherent. Now, uh, the first and foremost who began with this movement was uh, Chandi Prasad Bhatt, uh, who in a way tries to you know uh, begin uh, this idea of movement by uh, coming up with uh, establishing a small industries to employ the youths. Now, uh, in in one of the you know. Uh, <coughs> uh, what uh, Prasad has in a way expressed is let them know we will not allow the felling of a single tree when their man raises their axes. We will embrace the trees to 
to protect them. So, so with so much of commitment and dedication and with the realization that they can't do away without or uh, they can survive without the forest. This sort of uh, you know commitment is being seen in the context of the Chipfo movement. And, and, and in the words of Chandi Prasad, uh, we can see that uh, our movement goes beyond the erosion of the land to the erosion of human values. The center of all this is humankind. And if we are not in a good relationship with the environment, the environment will be destroyed and we will lose our ground. But if you have the erosion of humankind, humankind will hold the erosion of the soil. So, this perhaps is the you know guiding principle of the Chipko movement and another el elderly woman by the name called Gora Devi, uh, which is the which is the head of the village of the Mehila Mangal Dal was also instrumental in mobilizing the village women for the movement when the company uh, were you know yeah, the lumberjacks were marching towards uh, uprooting or felling the trees. Now, she in a way declared that the forest nurtures us like a mother. You will only be able to, you know, use your access on it, but you have to use them first on us. So, that sort of dedication and sacrifices is pretty much seen uh, in the one of the leaders. And of course, uh, Sundarlal Bahuna was also part of the movement. Uh, he is an environmentalist and uh, also received this coveted award called the Padma Bhushan for his contribution in the movement. Now, this movement, uh, in a way, uh, is an environmental conservation movement which, which come to the uh, public attention uh, way back in April 1973 when a group of women in Mandal village uh, which was located in the mountainous Himalayan region of Uttarakhand hugged the trees in order to prevent them from being felled. Now, in the next several years more than a dozen of confrontation between women and uh, lumberjacks that is those uh, companies uh, or occur in Uttarakhand and similarly, old non-violent and effective enshrining that is by using the tree hugger in conservation parlance. Now, in 1974, if you look at uh, a remarkable confrontation occurred in the rainy village of Uttarakhand where a women's group led by uh, Mrs. Gaur Devi blocked an army of lumberjacks by saying that this forest is our mother's uh, home and we will protect it with all our might. So, through this they also you know uh, admonish the lumberjacks that if the forest is cut the soil will be washed away that is the erosion will uh, eventually take place and then this will result to landslide and soil erosion and, and which will you know bring more floods and uh, destroy our fields and homes our water sources will dry up and all are the benefits we get from the forest will be finished so they have perhaps seen to be you know uh, foresee all these uh, you know uh, calamities if uh, the forests are being uh, destroyed or the trees are being felled so such kind of ecological awareness was pretty much inherent in them and uh, therefore this idea or commitment of you know uh, fighting against uh, the lumberjacks uh, was continued this notion of cut me down before you cut down a tree in a way you know uh, gets a lot of uh, media's attention and uh, which also bring a new humanized morality to abstract uh, environmental concerns. And uh, one of the point uh, also 
uh, Ganeshyam Salani, which talks about uh, by painting some verses, talks about let us protect and plant the trees, go awaken the villages and drive away the excrement. So, this sort of uh, uh, the idea of the Chipko movement was uh, first they have those leaders um, like the environmentalists uh, Sundarla Bahuna and also uh, who in a way are being uh, you know aroused if not motivated by their own lady that is the women. Now, the Chipko movement in a way gather this rapid momentum as it wrote the wave of the spirituality and uh, uh, by, by trying to you know relate themselves with the forest uh, and, and by organizing certain kind of these prayer meetings uh, which in a way tries to uh, we can perhaps say that uh, sort of a cultural politics is also being inherent and used in this particular movement. Now, the uh, they, they tend to perceive themselves as a custodian of this forest because it is where the spirits if not the God resides and, and they have this sort of trying to draw or maintain certain kind of spiritual connection uh, between them and the forest. Now, this particular movement in a way can be you know interpreted differently uh, from different uh, feminist perspective or uh, different ideologies. The feminist movement in a way popularize uh, this Chipko by pointing out that the poor rural women walk long distances to collect fuel and food and thus are the frontline victims of forest destructions. So, for any kind of uh, destruction of uh, environment or resources, the first and the four foremost victims or the brand is bear by the women because they are the one who are directly dependent on this, not just as uh, fuel and fooder, but also as uh, as I said, uh, a source of means of livelihood for them. They are pretty much dependent. Therefore, any kind of uh, displacement or any kind of destruction of resources has uh, strongly or uh, the extent of uh, effects it imposes on the women is uh, pretty much maximum. Uh, or rather on the other hand, the Gandhians would interpret by saying that the Chifko movement through this symbolic protests such as prayer fasting and uh, Padi Yatras that is the ritual marches in a way can be you know equated with the sort of the non-violent movement which is strongly uh, espoused by Gandhi himself. So, this sort of uh, a different interpretations is interesting to witness that how the Chipko is also to be seen from a different perspective. Now, I have uh, begun talking about what uh, ecofeminism is and the uh, ecological feminist philosophies which guide it and then how uh, the feminist themselves tends to interpret the relationship between uh, women and nature and then the idea of domination of nature in a way is as a result of something which is being uh, the domination of women which is socially and culturally constructed and for you to have a much more meaningful idea uh, I just uh, briefly talk about the Chivko movement which is partly seen as the first ecofeminist movement in India. So, to have a much more wider understanding you can please refer these uh, references I will stop here.